Excellent. Thank you very much. And I'll just wait for Jeff to pop his camera on. All right. Excellent. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. Welcome and thank you for joining us today at the Thayer School of Engineering at Dartmouth's Digital Transformation Certificate Information Session. Today, you will have the opportunity to hear from and speak with the faculty on this course. So before I jump into the agenda, a just a polite reminder that if you have questions during today's webinar, use the Q&A function to send them through to the team. And at the end, we will be reading those out. So if we can move on to the agenda slide, perfect, thank you. The agenda for today will begin with an introduction from the faculty. Then we are gonna hear from professors Jeffrey Parker, Vikrant Vazi and Elizabeth Menane about their respective courses. This will take about half an hour after we which will move into a Q&A session with the faculty for any outstanding questions you may have. Again, thank you and welcome. And I'll pass it along to the faculty for the introductions. All right. Thank you so much. Um, really wonderful to have everyone here. Um, perhaps in chat, it's always fun to see where people are dialing in from. Um, so I'm going to put mine in. I'm in Hanover, New Hampshire, USA. So there you can see that in chat. Um, so this is always a lot of fun. All right, so I'm Jeff Parker, uh, professor of engineering here at the Thayer School. I am also director of the Master of Engineering Management program. And this certificate is offered by a subset of the faculty who are, are heavily involved in delivering that program. Um, in terms of the background for this particular set of courses and, and this certificate, um, I, I, a little bit of background is I've spent a lot of my career thinking about digital technology and the way that it's changing uh, the economy, business strategy and society at large. Um, and so a lot of the work, and I'll, I'll go over a couple of the courses, um, has really built upon a couple of decades of both academic work, but I think of significant relevance to this audience, a lot of applied work with dozens of firms who have kind of opened their doors and shared their problems. Um, so really looking forward to kind of sharing the content and then answering your questions. Over to you, Vikrant. Hey everyone, this is Vikrant Vaze. I am a professor uh, in the Thayer School of Engineering at Dartmouth, and I am actually sitting right next door to Jeff right now, I believe in Hanover, New Hampshire as well. Uh, I'm also the program area lead for mechanical operations and systems engineering, and I am really excited to uh, work with you in the third course related to analytics and digital tools. So looking forward to it. Or do you, Liz? Thanks, Jeff, and thanks, Vikrant. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining. Uh, I'm Liz Murnane. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Engineering here at Dartmouth. I'll be teaching digital age product design and development. Uh, I have a background in computing and information science, and I specialize in human computer interaction, so user centered design, socio technical systems. So my focus is developing algorithms and interfaces that empower people to engage with data and information in everyday life. Um, and in addition to teaching, I run a lab at Dartmouth where we do research on those topics. And many of the principles and practices that guide us are the same as the product design and development process. So I had a wonderful time preparing the video lessons for that course, along with its readings, live session activities, the capstone project, so I hope um, students, you all, would find the experience of taking the course uh, similarly valuable and, and genuinely fun. So thanks again for being here. So let me touch a little bit on some of the program highlights, and in particular, some of the why um, for offering this program. And I think you know, one of the key issues, as I alluded to, is just how much the economy has changed. Now we can see that in our everyday lives with the, the technology that we interact with, but we can also see it in kind of the rise of, of big tech, if you will, um, where 20, 30 years ago, we'd have been primarily looking at say energy sector firms and banking and perhaps automotive sectors really being at the forefront of the economy. And, and there's been a, a real change. And I think it's important to understand the drivers of that change. And so if you think about the four courses that we've put together, um, they're really designed to cover, in effect, the what, 
the why it's happening, the how to measure, and then critically, the how. And that how breaks down along a couple of dimensions. I think it's no, no surprise that data has become kind of ubiquitous in our ability to manipulate it, work with it, derive insights and build products. Um, and so we'll spend a fair bit of time on that. But in working with many organizations and trying to help them through their digital transformation journeys, you also see a critical need for more design thinking and more effective product development and design processes, um, because that's just um, a real key to the effectiveness in, in undertaking some of these digital transformations. So the four courses are actually um, designed to work together as a unit. And then in terms of other highlights, we've got instructor-led um, kind of discussion and student support systems. So it's not just a, a kind of a canned video, but there's a lot of interaction built in. And as Liz said, there are real world projects that are designed um, to give you the chance to take the, the content from the course and then apply it in some dimension that's meaningful to you. Um, in terms of how we think about the broader context of Dartmouth, this is very much of a design-centered school. It's very much of a team-based school. It's very much human-centered and oriented. And, and our idea is to bring all of that through in, these, in this sequence of courses. So next slide. In terms of who you might think about the, the target audience, um, certainly we think about those early and mid-career professionals um, who are essentially trying to think about how their organizations can leverage the digital technology that's all around, the talent and the processes. Um, often they'll be the ones who are tasked with executing some of these digital transformation initiatives. Um, but I think it's also really important, and, and this operates at multiple levels in organizations, uh, it's really important for the leadership to have a, a, an appreciation of just how much things have changed and then what some of the key areas of investment are that they should be looking at and how they might empower people in their organizations to integrate these technologies into company strategy. And of course, any operational or strategic managers who are looking for both new revenue streams, new product lines, but also operational efficiencies. Uh, and then in terms of content, you know, we think that it's helpful if you have some foundational knowledge in data science, engineering, um, or even the platform technology stacks, but it's not required. We provide that background as part of the course content. So if you look to the next slide, please. So I'll be delivering course one, which is on digital transformation and platforms. And so just a quick highlight of the content in that class is we spend a fair bit of time up front thinking through how both operating models and business models have changed. Um, often, if you look into those, they tend to be conflated. So if you say, well, what's the business model? Then when you hear people describe it, they'll tie that into how it is that an organization actually creates value. But what's interesting is that with these digital technologies, we're starting to see, in effect, a split. You can do a lot of innovation along the operating model side for how it is that you organize a supply chain. You might disaggregate it and make it much more loosely affiliated. Um, you can also then innovate along another dimension, which is what's the way that you capture value from the processes that generate value? Is it going to continue to be this notion of selling a service or a product to an end consumer, or do you end up participating in sort of looser market-based structures? And those are things that organizations that have made the investments in end-to-end -end digital technology are able to do much more quickly. And we saw that, for example, in the way that the firms pivoted in both the supply and the demand disruption that were experienced early on in the COVID pandemic. Um, so we go through linear and platform value chains. Um, I start to, in effect, uh, set up Liz's course by talking about the criticality of product thinking before you end up trying to go to this broader notion of what's a platform where you're organizing 
know, distinct user types. Um, there's been a huge amount of innovation in the business to business side. A lot of what we've seen in digital transformation um, early on came from consumer facing systems, but now that same technology change is starting to infuse further up the supply chain. And so there's a lot of interest and investment in B2B systems, and we'll go through that. Um, I think from a managerial point of view, one of the most critical components, at least in course one, are the ways that organizations experience their transformations. Um, and that comes from a lot of work I've done with the World Economic Forum. We have uh, about 60 companies that have provided detailed case studies as part of this uh, advanced um, manufacturing global future council that I've been working on for the last couple of years. And we'll be bringing that data straight into the course. Um, and then we'll conclude with identifying gaps in the organization um, that are really critical to fill as you start to set it up for transformation success. Next slide, please, Sir Dash. All right, in course two, I then dovetail, now we've done the kind of the, the what and the why, but you might wanna to start to think about the metrics. Um, so we start out with this notion that data has become um, everywhere and our ability to capture it because of advanced materials technology uh, has just exploded. The second bullet is we start to think carefully, well, if data is everywhere and we hear about data analytics all the time, how does it generate value? How do we use analytics to actually do things that generate um, positive impacts on organizations? Then we'll kind of take that organizational idea a little bit further and start to think, well, how do you set yourself up to actually be able to bring analytics throughout most of the functions in an organization? Um, and then we start to think about one specific idea, which is analytics in product management. Again, starting to set up that how do you do this component in the back half of the certificate program. Um, one area that I tend to highlight is how important it is to get the right metrics to the right stage of a transformation. Um, I spent quite a bit of time as a, as a finance person early in my career uh, at GE, and a lot of that was around thinking about discounted cash flows, returns on investments, hurdle rates, payback periods, all very tangible ways of trying to measure both cost and potential benefits. Um, but what we see in some of these digital transformation initiatives is the cost side is very uncertain and the demand side or rather the benefit side is very uncertain. And adding those up, then calculating some sort of point estimate with some sort of an, you know confidence interval around it is nothing short of silly. And so you end up having to take a different view, which is what are the capabilities that you're creating? What's the optionality that those capabilities create? How do you think about exploiting that optionality by staging your development processes so you don't overcommit resources to what might end up being a not very productive path but maintain the flexibility to shift to things as they look more promising. Um, and then finally, we conclude with metrics for innovation so that you don't hobble your teams by putting the wrong metrics onto um, specific processes. So with that, over to you, Vikrant. Great, thank you, Jeff. So this dovetails really nicely into the next course, which I'm going to be delivering. Uh, and this is about digital analytics and tools for managerial decision making. So we're going to talk quite a bit about managerial decision making by trying to leverage the value that data and the whole digitization process will generate for us. So as many organizations realize, once they begin this digital transformation journey, then it comes to their attention that so many of the decisions, so many of the, so many of the processes that they were doing before can potentially be improved now by leveraging this data. And so we will start the course by first looking at quite a few different examples of well-known real-world organizations that have brought significant value to their uh, processes, to their 
planning to their operations by uh, doing exactly that, using data analytics to improve the managerial decision making. So first we will focus on the predictive part of it. So that brings us to the first bullet here, predictive analytics. So the question to ask here is, what do we expect in the future? It could be near future, it could be intermediate term future. And as Jeff very nicely put, um, prediction is hard. And there are a lot of uncertainties both on, both on the cost side as well as on the revenue side of things. So there are a lot of things that one may try to focus on predicting. There could be a question of predicting customer behavior, revenues, profits, market shares, costs, service utilization ratios, et cetera. So that's the focus of predictive analytics. And specifically, we are going to use supervised machine learning methods as a way of leveraging historical data that dig digitization will enable us to collect to identify the likelihood of various future outcomes. So that's going to consume a, a good uh, couple of weeks of our class. And then we are going to move on to what I call a scenario evaluation. And the way we are going to do that is by means of simulation. So here we are asking the question of what if we change something? What, I, what if I change the way I do a certain process slightly in so and so way? How would that reflect in terms of the various important metrics? So that's the question that we're going to try to answer uh, by focusing on discrete event simulation uh, models. So we're going to do that uh, in, uh, for, for about a week of our course. And then we are going to focus on the question of prescriptive analytics. So the question of, okay, what do we do exactly? Now that we have developed some predictive tools, and now that we are able to simulate the answers to various scenarios, can we get down to the question of what is the optimal way forward? So good prediction is an important essential element of that, but it's not enough. Just knowing what's going to happen does not necessarily tell us which of the hundreds or thousands or more possible actions is going to work out the best for our organization. So in the last week and a half of the class, we will switch over to prescriptive analytics. The question here is given data models and the prediction, prediction tools and a variety of constraints and KPIs, key performance indicators, what should a manager do to improve their decision making? What is the best amongst the hundreds or thousands or millions or billions of possible decisions that might be in the best interest of the organization? So that's a question of optimization as your the fourth bullet here says. The tool that we're going to use is, is from the family of optimization methods and we are going to apply them to questions such as process design, planning, as well as operations. Now, I want to mention that some basic working knowledge of Python is going to be quite useful to enable the hands-on piece of this course. And I think Python is really easy for those of you who have given it a try. It's a really easy and yet very versatile tool. So you can do a lot of different things. You can do predictive analytics, you can do scenario evaluation, you can do prescriptive analytics. All of these things are doable with just one type of software. So I highly encourage you to spend a little bit of time learning about that. Uh, and the course will have uh, a capstone project, which I'm very excited about because that's where you get to apply the uh, concepts we learn in the class for a problem that is of particular interest to you specifically, given your interest, given your background, given your ambitions going forward, etc. So we are going to implement all those uh, tools and methods uh, on the cloud using uh, Python based analytics of various kinds. So I am very much looking forward to teaching this class to all of you, uh, but I'll, I'll stop right here and uh, off to you, Liz. Thanks, Vikrant. Um, hi again, everybody. Yeah, absolutely. I'd, I'd love to share a little bit more about the fourth course in the series, which is Digital Age Product Design and Development. So product design and development is essentially this craft of identifying an opportunity in the market, taking that idea and turning it into a delightful product, which could be either something entirely new 
or it might be an evolution of an organization's existing product. It could be entirely software-based, you know, an app or a web-based product or uh, involve a physical good or be a bundle of both physical and service components. Um, as mentioned, as we're increasingly seeing from a number of organizations who are aiming to transform their business by bringing in those digital and service offerings. But across all these product types and configurations, a really central tenant of, of the course is that in today's market, the bar is extremely high in terms of the quality of experience that people have come to expect from consumer products, uh, meaning digital transformation fundamentally rests on solving customer-centered problems and delivering the best user experience possible. And so many of our lessons in my course will revolve around that people piece. Uh, for instance, we'll kick off the course by covering what design thinking is all about and how its human-centered emphasis helps us deliver that sort of superior customer experience that's vital for a product success today. Similarly, lean and agile approaches and how they also target maximizing value to the customer as well as the business. Um, and in general, taking a lot of these buzzwords you may be hearing a lot of lately, like design thinking and lean and agile, minimum viable products, and helping clarify what these ideas really mean and how to actually apply the methods they represent to develop products in an effective way. So the four modules uh, within course four, it'll focus on helping you master the four main phases of the product design and development process, uh, discovery, ideation, creation, and testing. And then again, what are those tried and true methods to employ during each of those phases? Really helping you to understand that product design and development is a process and there are specific steps to follow to incrementally make rapid and predictable progress towards conceptualization and creation of a truly transformative new product. So during that first module on that early discovery phase, you'll learn how to identify exceptional product opportunities in the market, how to engage with customers in a process we call need finding to gather data uh, and a strong understanding about their challenges, desires, expectations that would motivate a person to actually purchase an Envision product. Um, then we'll, we'll cover how to translate and prioritize those needs into specific measurable product specifications. Um, as part of that, we'll learn how to analyze the competitive landscape, including how to benchmark existing related products according to those specs to help figure out how to best position a new product. Um, and then we'll learn how to decompose that design challenge and apply methods for problem solving and creativity to brainstorm a wide range of potential solutions. Um, we'll also help you get comfortable with prototyping. So creating and testing iteratively higher fidelity versions of those potential solutions from sketches and paper prototypes to digital mockups to functional prototypes that we keep testing with customers to gather feedback, make decisions, continually improve the, the product's overall user experience. And we'll learn specific principles and metrics related to interaction design and usability. So through hands-on exercises throughout the learning modules, as well as through uh, that course project, you'll become proficient in applying all these skills, uh, including project management and team coordination strategies too. Um, for the course project specifically, you'll work in small teams to design and develop an actual digital product that excites you and your teammates. Um, and the goal is that by the end of the course, teams will have produced a prototype version of their product, working towards a proof of concept level and that minimum viable product that brings your idea to life um, and that's used the methods and principles you've learned in the course in order to address a real problem and ultimately deliver a successful product that offers true value to customers. So I hope those topics sound as exciting to you as they are to me. And of course, be happy to elaborate on anything or answer additional questions during the Q&A. So thanks, I guess back to you, Jeff. Awesome, Liz, and I, I wanna take that class. Again, <laughs> that, that sounds amazing. All right. Well, thank you very much to all the faculty for those course overviews. That was fantastic. Um, before we move into a Q&A session, I just wanted to touch on this slide that you see in front of you at the moment, this Learn More slide. Now, this webinar is being recorded, so uh, the link can be shared with any uh, attendee for this information after the fact. And also, if you want to know more information or if you have any procedural admission, admission questions, uh, please go to the Dartmouth uh, Engineering Digital Transformation page on Coursera with that link, and you can contact the Thayer School of Engineering Admissions team through there, or you can contact them by the email um, advertised on the Thayer School of Engineering page as well. And um, 
the Thea admissions team are fantastic. They're actually with us today, Jessica Moody and Sarah Gagney. So um, they will be the ones that'll be getting back to you uh, with the uh, with the answers to your questions. So um, we are at about 155 and we have about half an hour of Q&A and we do have a few questions that have come in. So this first one is going out to um, all the faculty. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand it at all, but uh, here we go. Are you going to integrate the multiverse wave empowered by blockchain architecture into your course? Um, I'll take that one. <laughs> so in terms of specifically, no, but one of my colleagues and co-authors actually just put a piece out in Harvard Business Review last week on precisely this topic and uh, joined my class uh, this fall as a guest lecture on this topic. So I think the way I would want to cover it would be to incorporate it into a student project. And the reason is that that's the kind of thing that is likely to change from year to year. And so those student projects are terrific ways to kind of keep the, the content absolutely current to the minute. And I think that's one of those areas that would be a terrific area to, uh, to assemble a team and take a closer look at. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, the second question is from Elena, and this is about balance. Um, will the course teach digital, digital transformation skills to those without a background in the topic and those with a background in the topic, so it is balanced for both sort of student bodies? I'm gonna take the first whack and then I really would love to hear Liz and, and Vikrant, but this is a, a kind of a perennial question that organizations face when they start to think about transformation. And so when you identify a gap, you've got a couple of choices. Um, do I upskill the people who are already in the organization or do I end up trying to hire people, for example, who have deep machine learning or some sort of data analytics skills? Um, and the answer of course is you, you really end up having to do both. And the reason is that if you have sort of these new sets of tools that you're bringing in, that you're trying to have some sort of transformation effort, you've got to have some awareness in the organization of the why and the what are they doing. But sometimes you actually do need technical experts to really drive that forward. So I'll let uh, Liz and Vikrant kind of dovetail onto that. Sure, thanks Jeff, I'm happy to go first. I, I would say in uh, product design and development, it's it really a, an important aspect is integrating um, multiple aspects over an organization together. Um, you know, the designers and the, the more market facing individuals um, together with engineers, software, mechanical, um, as uh, you know, as well as other parts of the team um, coordinating with management and beyond. Um, and so actually having that diversity of perspectives um, involved meaningfully throughout the process um, typically leads to more creative solutions, better outcomes um, that then resonates um, as, as strongly as possible um, with the customer base. And so um, in course four, especially, we'll actually encourage teams to assemble according um, to those kind of diversity of skill sets and, and someone who's more or less familiar, um, it, it's okay. We'll, we'll um, as Jeff mentioned, train everybody up. And especially in product design and development, I'll just add as well, it's, it's another one of the reasons why the systematic methods are so vital because it allows um, inclusive participation by everybody on the team, even if they don't feel that they are the expert or um, fully skilled in any particular area of the process. Um, these these step-by-step -step methods really allow that kind of engagement, um, which again, enhances the overall process and outcomes. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. great. No, I, I'm going to echo both what Liz and Jeff said. In fact, I would argue that this is actually a really positive thing, having students come from very different backgrounds. And keep in mind that one of the great learning opportunities here is not just what we end up delivering. There is also a lot of learning that's going to happen 
by the peer to peer via the peer to peer sort of interactions and and the facilitated sessions that we will have so i would highly encourage people to interact with each other and learn from each other's experiences and i think having this diversity is just going to enrich the overall experience and keep in mind that we are not creating a very high bar in any particular dimension to try to enter the class we are going to take students who have a variety of valuable experiences and teach them some important core skills that are important for digital transformation along these variety of dimensions that uh, jeff and liz and i will specifically focus on so i think it's a it's a great positive to have um, students of all kinds of backgrounds and i would i would i would encourage all of you to think uh, uh, in in the same direction as well as an asset rather than as a challenge. Excellent, thank you. So the next question is for Jeff uh, specifically, and the question is, how does this program differ from where others might be able to find you and the content that you teach? Yeah. So and and specifically, I think that somebody zeroed in on the uh, platform strategy course. So this is, as you alluded to in the question. It's, it's more applied in the sense of we're focusing on tools. So we will actually deliver some of these analytics tools. We will deliver um, product design development tools and exercises. And then in terms of the parts that I deliver, uh, I've got a lot of new work that I've done, um, as I mentioned in the World Economic Forum on business to business, and have really gone down a lot more of the, the digital transformation pathways and the challenges that organizations face. So I don't see them as substitutes. I see them as, as complements. They really dovetail nicely together. Perfect. Thank you, Jeff. So this is a question for all from Eric. How will use cases for your projects be determined? I can go first. I have an easy answer. Um, so in my case, the, the course is split between uh, some, some homework uh, questions or assignments and uh, also a capstone project. The homeworks are pretty well uh, defined. They are what they are, but they are also short. I think a lot of the learning will happen on the capstone project, and those are really open. There is a lot of different possible ways of defining them. And uh, I highly encourage you all to think about what might be a great capstone for yourself. On the other hand, uh, there is also an opportunity to pick one of the topics that we can define for you. So it's really up to you. If you would like to go in a particular direction, then, uh, then I would highly encourage you to do that and help you to do that. On the other hand, if you would like to pick one of the predefined problems, then that works equally well as well. Perfect. Jeff, uh, Liz, did you have anything to add to that one? I did. If I can speak to course Please. four, sure. Yeah. So in in uh, our our in course four, well, similarly, the 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 topic of the capstone will be up to students on on um, focusing on an identified opportunity that that one the team is passionate about um, because that's extremely important. Um, but also just because these are really important skills to learn um, and we'll spend a, a good amount of time in the, in the first week understanding how to actually go about identifying um, compelling and, and feasible, um, both from a technical standpoint as well as um, economically viable and then really desired by people, um, these kind of three main innovation challenges um, that that's, it's so important to tackle in developing a new product. And so, so I very much want you, the students to be able to, to feel comfortable with those, um, those different methods to, to search both externally through you know, consumer ethnography or, or, or customer commitment, collective input, um, maybe looking at the, the existing uh, products on the market, um, as well as seeking more internally on your team. There are a variety of different methods um, that that you you could potentially utilize to identify that uh, that product opportunity you will eventually pursue, and then again there are systematic methods to actually screen and filter down um, according to, to to metrics to make sure again in the long run it's it's worth pursuing and will actually hopefully pay off. 
So, so that's a, a really important part of the process is understanding how to go through that identification and filtering and screening and selection process. Um, and so absolutely in course four, it'll, the use cases will be up to the teams to discover. And I think I have a, a, a similar mix to, to Liz and Vikrant. Um, in terms of the actual assignments, those will be readings. Some of them will actually have interviews and fireside chats. Uh, I had a, a really good talk with the head of, uh, of platform um, for a major CRM firm, HubSpot. And uh, Scott will, will kind of share his views on some of these topics. Um, in terms of the capstone, kind of philosophically, I'd be much more interested in seeing the students identify the problem space and then craft a solution because there are almost infinite number of solutions to any particular problem. But I think the people who are, are most successful are ones that sift through all the noise and distill it down to a, a crisp problem statement that you can then start to put solutions against. So I think right at the beginning in the first course, we'll, we'll try that process out. Perfect, thank you all. So this is a question from Edwin to all the faculty. Is this course likely to equip one with the knowledge to help firms in identification of opportunities that can be leveraged by digital technologies? I, I sure think so. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, I'll, mine is at a, at a sort of a more organizational level, but I think all the way through, you're going to start to see gaps, topics, interesting issues um, that an organization would then have the opportunity to put some resources against. So uh, if anything, I mean, that could easily be part of the philosophy for doing this whole certificate program to begin with. So I love it. Yeah, and, and very similar answer for myself as well. Uh, the whole point of course three is to try to be able to understand what kinds of questions can be answered using the power of analytics and then how to answer them, right? So what kinds of questions can be answered sometimes becomes as important as how to answer them. So once we can think about the questions, we can think about whether or not there is the right kind of infrastructure available or right kind of context available in the in the in the organizational setting that you are targeting so absolutely the question can be inverted and asked as okay which of these things can i do with my organization so agreed and and similarly for the the product design and development course in in general we'll speak quite a bit about how the process goes through um these kind of flaring and focusing rhythms. And so much of the flare portion is creating choices um, for an organization and then also having the methods to converge back in and make choices. And so that applies right up front from identifying opportunities that um, are really exceptional um, all throughout remaining problem solving, uh, execution, production, strategizing kind of following this, this similar kind of method of um, helping to identify uh, and create choices and then make them effectively. Excellent, thank you all. So this is a question from Mark that um, I'll be able to answer. And that is after the January cohort, do you know when the next cohort will occur? And the answer to that is not yet. Um, so stay tuned and please check the Coursera and Thayer pages. We're really excited to be bringing this, um, this Coursera certificate with Thea to market. And we're focusing on that first cohort starting in January, but we are absolutely excited to be offering extra cohorts. So we don't have dates on those at the moment, but please do stay tuned, reach out to the Thea admissions team at the contact details we gave you. And as soon as those dates are determined, um, we will let you know. So the next question after that is um, specifically for Elizabeth and Vikrant. What types of software and tools will we be using in courses three and four, and are they free or paid? I can go first. Uh, so yeah, so that's a great question. So everything is free. <laughs> We're going to only focus on open source stuff. Uh, and specifically in course three, I will um, work with uh, Python 
and it will be in a Jupyter notebook um, setup. So it's it's very user friendly, um, absolutely uh, open source and absolutely free. Yeah, similarly in, in um, course four, we'll point you to a number of resources online, free tools um, that will, will be valuable um, throughout the product design and development process from um, team management, project management tools um, that help you, uh, again, organize and prioritize and coordinate about different tasks your team is working on. Um, as I, I mentioned, um, one of the early topics, we'll talk about kind of these agile lean methods. And so as part of that, we'll give you specific tools um, that help you uh, rapidly and effectively um, make, make progress um, um, on, a, on a project opportunity. Um, and then when it actually gets time to, to start generating opportunities for brainstorming, for prototyping, um, there are all sorts of online tools will help you get familiar, um, give you some options, encourage you to, to try them out with your team, figure out what will work best, given your specific needs, um, all the way through prototyping. Um, we can actually create um, incredibly realistic, um, functional uh, prototypes using all online free tools. Um, and so that's one of the things will also help you get comfortable in the fourth course, even if you don't have programming, expertise, uh, kind of pointing you to some of these other um, techniques and toolkits that'll help you still um, get very close to a proof of concept prototype using all these free resources. Thank you, Liz and Vikrant. So the next question is from Peter and is directed to Jeff. Is there a focus on building the digital ecosystem? How to help the organization identify what applications are available and how to wave them into a core organization solution? So I'll, I'll say it's more at the functional level than it is at the specific software solution level. So I think it would be more about identifying gaps in organizational capabilities and not so much on would I go for this specific software vendor or tool or that one, because of course those change. Um, with that being said, projects are a great opportunity to then sift through what some specific solutions are in any given year. And then uh, in particular, there's so much open source uh, sort of capabilities out and so many cloud solutions that our ability to play with these tools and integrate them has never been, never been better. Perfect, thank you. And then uh, this is actually a question for me from Juliet. Uh, what time frame slash days of the week are classes or lectures offered? Also, are there applications for this program every semester? So uh, for the first half of the question, um, to be determined still, we are looking at two synchronous live sessions per week, and they're gonna be spaced wide enough apart to target the global uh, student body that we're looking for. So, so there will be two synchronous sessions and we'll try and place them in, um, in times during the week where different areas of the student body globally can come and kind of attend. So that opens up accessibility um, to the whole class. Uh, the second question is also, are there applications for this program every semester? The application deadline for this cohort coming up in January actually closes at the beginning of January. Um, if you go to the Coursera page, the specific date is there. We have not determined the next application deadline. However, as soon as that first enrollment deadline is closed, you can start putting in inquiries and applications for the next cohort. And as soon as that cohort is determined and we know when it's gonna start, you'll be able to uh, enroll for that cohort. So please do stay tuned. Um, we're still working at some of the dates. Um, it's a fresh off the press course, but we are very excited for your interest in, in the cohorts for the ones following January. Um, and we have a question from Jorg. Um, I hope I pronounced your name uh, correctly, Jorg. From your table of contents, I feel that we have a rough one third to two third managerial leadership topic compared to operational topics. Did I understand that correctly? Actually, it's more about 50-50 because the first two courses are really the managerial view and the organizational view. And then the second two, you know, the, the courses three and four are more operational and tools and, and skills based. So we're trying to give a balance. Perfect, thank you. Um, so 
I think we have the last question coming in now, so bear with me. And this question is for all the faculty um, who are on today. How about the public sector, digital transformation for communities, yet to connect to the internet and designing programs for such entities, or the government for service provision? Uh, I'm going to start with that, and then I'd love to hear a way in. Um, I think this is one of the areas that's um, sort of most ripe, if you will, for transformation efforts. And we, we've done some of this work before. So, for example, I've done some work with the New York um, Public Services Commission and the New York Energy kind of Research and Development Authority around bringing in different market design mechanisms and digital transformation and kind of peer-to-peer energy trading markets. So I, I think there's a lot to be done here in terms of the way you think about cities, towns, villages, um, adapting to digital technology and then changing processes um, really to make our cities and villages and towns you know, sort of more livable and you know, both more efficient, but I think more livable is a better objective. Absolutely. And I, I can add on that uh, in terms of course three, I think one of the things that I have done and I'm very passionate about is helping a lot of the public sector organizations uh, use these tools, uh, the analytics tools. And we don't always have to have very heavy technology for implementing some of these things. So I am going to definitely give some examples from my experiences and I will motivate you to hopefully uh, go do the same uh, with other ex examples and experiences related to uh, both sort of uh, government agencies at various levels, including local, and also work with a uh, lot of the NGOs and, and nonprofits. Um, and I can give you some examples um, su such as uh, small towns where we are working on improving the planning and operations of their bus services, for example, or uh, for example, another interesting topic I worked on is uh, with World Wildlife Fund, trying to figure out how to schedule the, the folks who go on these long voyages on fishing, uh, fishing expedient expeditions to make sure that they are compliant and, and uh, are consistent with the environmental requirements enforced uh, on those practices. So there are a lot of places where you don't necessarily have to be high tech. You can still use what data you have to come up with um, implementable tools and, and insights for managerial decision making. So yes, this is a long answer and the short answer is yes, absolutely public sector. We are very passionate about that and we will give you examples on how to how to make things work there too. Yeah, it's a great question. I can jump in just to add that so much of, as I mentioned, the emphasis of course four is that people piece. Um, so really centering that deep engagement um, and understanding of, of people's needs, challenges, lived experiences, values, and then how do we come up with solutions um, that are meaningful? And so even if you know, a number of our conversations will be in a business context um, or, or for, for a, a product to sell, they're absolutely applicable um, to, again, just deeply engaging and understanding and respecting people. Um, and I'll repeatedly point out in a number of the lessons, um, different caveats or places to be mindful or tread carefully um, in thinking about who is included versus excluded or um, disproportionately advantaged or underserved um, in, in some of these techniques, um, which are absolutely then going to be relevant um, for more kind of community driven missions as well. Perfect. Well, that's it for questions today. Um, I'm going to let Erin quickly um, bring up uh, the Thayer School of Engineering uh, page for this course. Um, and in the meantime, thank you to Professors Parker, Vaza, and Menain for coming today um, and also uh, being the content experts on this course. Um, it's humbling and we are very thankful for the global uh, attendees today. I was watching the list of uh, locations and places come in and it was a truly worldwide attendance. So uh, thank you to all that came today. 
Um, before we do uh, break uh, at the end of this webinar, Jeff, I might ask you just to speak to these last key takeaways about uh, what students will get from this certificate. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we've done a, a fair bit of work around what the jobs look like now in terms of the types of areas firms are hiring. And the way to do that is we pulled about 12,000 LinkedIn um, job postings by companies and then sifted through those and essentially clustered them. And they cluster into some distinct areas. Um, so a fairly narrow cluster is setting strategy for digital transformation. But I think uh, a much more important area is at least in terms of the bulk of employment is in effect, people who can coordinate with external participants in ecosystems. So we heard some questions about that. And people who can set the trajectory of the product, if you will, that's inside a company. And, and by product, I really mean the infrastructure that the organization is investing in and developing in order to then accelerate their ability to build solutions on top of it and also accelerate their ability to connect with external ecosystem partners. So just a, a huge amount of kind of ferment that's happening um, in terms of where you see organizations hiring. And we also see organizations building an in effect programs where they might hire a hundred people. So for example, JP Morgan had this big organization um, and they ended up just investing massively to try to do some of this transformation effort. Um, and, and, and we think that makes sense because if you do kind of onesie twosie, you might just get absorbed into the ongoing efforts of any company. And that's where you see these centers of excellence pop up or you see new organizations that are designed to drive transformation. Um, and organizations just need to populate these. So we see a lot of demand for people who are literate in this, understand the why, and also have the basic tools to participate effectively. Perfect, well, thank you very much everyone for attending. Um, I know the team put the link to the engineering Dartmouth uh, page uh, in the chat and we're going to leave the digital transformation certificate page just up on the screen share for a moment. So Erin, if I can get you to jump over to that tab. Um, so this is the page that you'll wanna visit on Coursera to get information. Otherwise, uh, and yes, Aaron is circling the enroll now button. We do hope to see a lot of you in the course. We're very excited to bring this to you and uh, we hope to see you in January. So uh, with that, thank you very much. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate you coming to join us today. Thank you, everyone. Looking forward to talking to you all. Absolutely. <laughs>